Hello everyone and welcome back to True Crime Guru and yet another case to discuss. Just a quick reminder if you haven't already to go ahead and subscribe and turn on notifications. You can also find the channel on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so go ahead and give us a follow. Today's case takes us to the Great Smoky Mountain National Park also known as the Smokies. The Great Smoky Mountain National Park is the most visited national park in the United States, known for its beautiful scenery and nearby attractions in Gatlinburg, Tennessee and Asheville, North Carolina. It's a spot that I particularly like myself. It's not a very far drive for me and it makes the perfect weekend getaway. But even with as great as the Smokies are, they are not immune to tragedy. On October 8th, 1976, 16 year old Trenny Lynn Gibson was on a field trip with her high school class in the Great Smoky Mountains, but she would never make it home. Trenny seemingly disappeared into thin air that day, leaving a lot of people to wonder if she had fallen victim to the mountains themselves an animal predator, or even more likely, a human predator. The morning of October 8th, 1976, started off as a really rainy, cold, and kind of gross day in the eastern part of Tennessee. This weather was particularly worrisome for 16-year-old Trini Gibson because her horticulture class had a outdoor field trip planned for that day. So she was concerned that these conditions would cause the trip to be canceled. Now I'm a city boy and I am ashamed to admit that I did quickly have to Google what horticulture was. So if you're like me and you do not know, horticulture is the science of growing plants and gardening. And this kind of thing was right up Trini's alley. She took a special interest in plant life and living things in general. She even planned to attend the University of Tennessee after high school to study landscape and architecture. So she was particularly excited for this field trip. Now, the students were kept secret about the actual destination of the trip but hey, it's a field trip and that means that they would not have to be in class. So they were definitely hoping that it was still on. Trini's mom, Hope Gibson, had dropped her off at Bearden High School in Knoxville, Tennessee that morning. Since she still thought she was going on the trip, Trini had left her purse and her school books in her mom's car. When she was on her way into the building, she had come up to another student and was like, hey, is the field trip still on? And the student was like, yeah. Like I said, the students did not know exactly where they were going. But as soon as they got on the bus, their teacher, Mr. Dunlap, announced that the destination was the Great Smoky Mountains. And the students were super pumped about this, especially Trenny. The part of the national park they were headed to was the Klingman's Dome Watchtower, where the students were set to hike the Forney Creek Trail. The watchtower itself is a pretty cool site and is actually the highest point in the park and offers some pretty amazing views. So I'm sure the group would have liked to explore the tower as well, but I don't think the weather that day would have permitted it. The tower is actually in North Carolina on the Tennessee-North Carolina border and was about 36 miles or 57 kilometers away from Knoxville. On this short little drive, Trini was sitting on the bus next to a boy named Robert Simpson. Just a quick disclaimer, there are a lot of Roberts in this story, so I will refer to Robert Simpson by his first and last name throughout to avoid confusion. Robert Simpson was actually a friend of Trini's older brother, Robert Gibson Jr., 
who I will call Bob since he went by that. Bob was no longer in high school and just happened to be on leave from the Navy at this time. And he had asked his friend Robert Simpson to kind of keep an eye on Trini throughout this field trip. I guess this is the first time that Trini had been this far from Knoxville, like without her parents. So Bob was just being the protective older brother and had asked his friend to keep an eye on his little sis. It was about noontime when the bus had arrived at the park. Now, the teacher, Mr. Dunlap, was the only adult on the trip with about 40 kids. So he gave them very specific instructions as to what was expected of them. They were instructed to hike up the Forney Creek Trail up to Andrews Bald while making some observations about the greenery and plant life on the way. You know, school stuff. They were not to mess with any of the plants and were not to go any further than Andrews Bald and were not to take any side trails. And they were set to be back at the bus at 3.30 no later. I know this whole situation of like one chaperone and 40 kids and the kids are pretty much on their own. So probably sounds like kind of crazy to some of you, but keep in mind that this was the 70s and it was a less safety conscious time to put it lightly. The kids had split up into groups and started hiking the trail. The trail was said to be kind of steep, but was also said to be a relatively moderate hike. They had all brought packed lunches with them, so they were just hanging out, eating lunch, and being teenagers. Trini had hiked the trail with Robert Simpson, and I guess she was a little underdressed for the weather, only wearing a blouse with a sweater and jeans. So Robert Simpson, being a gentleman, had lent his orange and brown plaid wool jacket to Trini. Once they made it up to Andrews Bald, Trini and Robert Simpson ate their lunches and kind of hung out for a bit. But when Trini was ready to head back down the trail, Robert wasn't quite ready to leave yet and wanted to stay behind and track a bear. Which is a little strange and seems like kind of a stupid thing to do. But at the same time, it also definitely seems like something a teenage boy would do. So Trini had headed back down the trail on her own. There were a lot of groups of students and other hikers on the trail that day. And they had all reported that when they saw Trini hiking back down, she was going at a really fast pace. She did eventually catch up with a group of girls, and Trini was kind of walking with them, but not really. And eventually the girls wanted to stop and take a rest break. And they had even asked Trini, who had been going down this trail at a really fast pace, if she wanted to take a second as well. But Trini did decline and kept going. One of the girls did report that she had seen Trini crouch down and look at something to her right on the trail. And this would actually be the last time that Trini Gibson would be seen. When they started going again, the girl even tried to stop and see what Trini may have been looking at, but it was just thick brush and rocky terrain like the rest of the trail had been and nothing special. So the girls just kind of assumed that Trini kept going and didn't really think anything else of it at the time. When 3.30 came around and all the students were supposed to be back at the bus, one of the students had noticed that Trini Gibson had not made it back and had even asked Robert Simpson if he knew where she was. Robert did explain that he did not walk back down with Trini and even went on to tell his whole tracking the bear thing. Mr. Dunlap was made aware that Trini had not made it back and decided to just give it like another 10 minutes or so just in case she was falling behind or something. But that 10 minutes comes and goes and Trini still had not made it back. 
So Mr. Dunlap and another student decided to walk back up the trail to see if they could find her, but were ultimately unsuccessful. It was about 4.30 p.m. when the National Park Service was alerted that 16-year-old Trenny Gibson was missing in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. A hiker turning up missing in a national park is nothing out of the ordinary, and usually they are just lost and are found rather quickly. So I'm sure the National Park Service was expecting to locate Trenny that day. Workers from both the North Carolina and the Tennessee parts of the park were called in to help search for Trenny. The bus had actually left back to the school and Mr. Dunlap stayed behind to help search as well. These students were under his supervision and it was his responsibility to make sure that they were all safe. So I can only imagine the amount of guilt he must have felt now that one of them was missing. It wasn't until 8 p.m. when Hope Gibson was notified that her daughter was missing. That was about three and a half hours after the NPS was notified. I'm not exactly sure why they didn't contact Hope sooner. I'm assuming because they figured they would find Trini quickly and didn't want to worry her parents. Some of you may be wondering why Hope was not already concerned because Trini had not come home but Trini did have an after-school job in the food court at the local mall. So Hope probably just figured that Trini was at work or something. Trini's father, Robert Gibson Sr., had just landed at the airport after being away for work when he was notified of her disappearance. Both of Trini's parents had headed to the park with some of her clothes so that they could be used to track her scent. However, they had gotten there kind of late and the weather had taken a turn for the worse with high winds and heavy rain. So it made the ground searches a little bit more difficult and it was dangerous to have helicopters in the air. So day one of the search for Trini Gibson would ultimately be called off around 3 a.m. Searchers, of course, were not giving up, and when conditions were better, several sets of scent tracking dogs were brought in. And they had all tracked Trini's scent back to the same places. Back to the Klingman Dome's observation tower, and then also to a road that was about 1.6 miles away at a place called Collins Gap. There were some cigarette butts located on the shoulder of this road, and weirdly enough, cigarette butts of the same brand were found nearby where Trini was last seen on the trail, as well as some empty beer cans. Searchers had also observed that some ferns nearby where Trini was last seen had been disturbed as well. And by that, I think they just mean bent or walked on. Between October 8th and November 2nd of 1976, an estimated 756 people had participated in the search for Trini Gibson. During this time, the Gibsons were staying at a motel in nearby Gatlinburg to stay close to the park. The search would ultimately be called off in early November because the National Park Service would determine that Trini was no longer in the park. However, the Great Smoky Mountains are massive, covering about 522,500 acres, 95% of which is forested areas. I don't know exactly how much of the park they searched, but I obviously doubt that they searched everywhere. The Gibsons were devastated, and the winter months made it impossible to conduct any searches at the park. For those of you who are dog lovers, this will probably tug on your heartstrings a little bit, but Robert Gibson Sr. said that their beloved dog Mitzi would wait at the window for Trini to come home. Robert Sr. did organize his own search in April of 1977, which I believe several hundred people had participated in, but unfortunately they did not find Trini. The family had to start opening themselves to the idea that maybe Trini was no longer in the park. But if Trini was not in the park, then where could she have gone? 
a lot of people seem to think that she was abducted. And that is because of where her scent was tracked back to the road. But there were a lot of people on the trail that day. 40 students plus other hikers. How could someone have possibly grabbed Trini and dragged her all that way without someone seeing something? I personally just don't see it because even the terrain outside of the trail was really rocky and steep and would have been difficult to hike on your own, let alone while overtaking a another human being. You would think that Trini would have been fighting off her kidnapper and screaming, so someone would have had to have heard or saw something. When discussing the theory about Trini being abducted, people tend to get really focused on these cigarette butts. And I will admit that it does seem like a really wild coincidence that these same brand of cigarettes were found at the last place that Trini was seen and where her scent was tracked to. However, I was not able to verify what brand the cigarettes were. And I would really like to know because if they were like Marble Reds or another popular brand like that, then they really could have been anybody's cigarettes. It was also mentioned on coldcaseexplorations.com that like 37% of people smoked back then. So maybe we shouldn't get too hyper-focused on these cigarette butts. I also found something that would indicate that the cigarette butts might have been Trenny's. A former classmate told WBLR in 2017 that they remembered Trenny from the smoking area at school. And I know some of you are like, what? Smoking area at school? Again, this is the 70s, and that was something that was rather normal back then. I'm not saying that the theory of Trini being abducted by a stranger is completely incredible. I mean, it certainly wouldn't be the first time I've heard of a predator preying on women in a national park. I mean, there are entire TV shows and podcasts dedicated to that kind of thing. But if Trini was met with foul play, there is actually more evidence that the perpetrator may have been a little closer to home. Shortly after her disappearance, something that belonged to Trini would turn up. Hope had bought Trini and her younger sister two identical Stanley brand combs. And Trini had pretty long hair, so she was said to always have this comb on her. Well, the comb would be located inside Robert Simpson's car. Now, he says that Trini had given him the comb on the day of the field trip to hold on to, which totally makes sense. I could see Trini giving it to him to hold on to for safekeeping so that it didn't get lost on the hike. What's unclear is why he didn't subsequently return the comb to the Gibsons after Trini's disappearance. And there could be a totally innocent reason for that, like maybe he just forgot that he had it. But some people, and by some people I mean online commenters, so take that as you will. Some people think that Robert had kept the comb as a memento after doing something to harm Trini. A lot of people have called into question Robert Simpson's whole weird story about tracking a bear. Because, like, why would anybody do that? It has also been reported that no one saw him on their way back down the trail on the day of the field trip. Now, personally, I don't give much credence to that because there were a lot of people on the trail and you're not going to notice everybody. But Robert Simpson did say something really weird to Trini's little sister, Tina. One night early into Trini's disappearance, while the parents were at the park, Robert had stopped by the Gibson home and had said to Tina, quote, If Calvin Bowman has Trini, he will kill her. If he does not have her, I think she must have run off with some horny hitchhiker. End quote. Now, I know all of you are like, who the hell is Calvin Bowman? 
Well, Kelvin Bowman was a fellow student of Trenny's that has a bit of an unpleasant history with the Gibsons. In October of 1975, a year prior to Trenny's disappearance, Kelvin had reportedly broken into the Gibson home. Now, I don't know what his intentions were, whether he was there to rob them or what, but some have said that Kelvin had a bit of a crush on Trenny and have speculated that he may have been there to harm her in some way. Now, in a bit of a funny yet sad outcome, he was actually shot in the foot by Hope Gibson and was subsequently arrested. Kelvin Bowman was sentenced to two years in a juvenile detention center and reportedly made threats against Trenny Gibson in the courtroom during his sentencing. He was a minor, and I suppose you could say this was a relatively minor offense. So he only ended up serving six months of his sentence and was out at the time of Trenny's disappearance. However, investigators were able to get statements from school staff saying that they saw Kelvin in class that day. But some people speculate whether or not he was actually in class or if the investigators were just taking the teacher's word for it. But either way, he was ultimately cleared of having any involvement in Trenny's disappearance. What's weird to me is how quickly Robert Simpson was to not only throw Kelvin Bowman's name out there as possibly being involved, but going as far to say that if it was not Kelvin, that it was a horny hitchhiker. Was he possibly throwing all of this on the table to potentially cast suspicion off of himself? And if that is the case, then what motive would Robert have had to harm Trenny? Was he possibly infatuated with her in some way? Some people have actually even speculated that Robert Simpson was somehow in cahoots with Calvin Bowman in some kind of conspiracy to harm Trenny. I personally have doubts about that. I honestly don't know, and there is definitely some suspicious stuff about Robert Simpson, but not enough for me to think that he was definitely involved. At the very least, he is guilty of breaking his promise to Trini's brother about watching after her. It might surprise you that the comb found in Robert Simpson's car was not the only item belonging to Trini to be recovered. Trini was wearing a star sapphire pendant and a ring on the day that she disappeared. These pieces of jewelry had held importance to Trini because they were gifts from her family. Well, somehow these pieces of jewelry had ended up in the possession of a fellow sophomore student at Bearden High. This girl would not say where she got the jewelry from, which is super weird. And she also said that she would return the jewelry to the Gibsons, but I guess she did not. Now, this student was confirmed to not have been on the field trip that day, but how she ended up with Trini's things is a mystery. Which really makes me wonder how much some of these other students that were on the field trip were looked into. I don't know if Trini's jewelry had held any monetary value, but a teenager's perception of value might be a little bit more distorted than mine. So I have to wonder if a student or students had wanted to rob Trini and somehow caused her harm in the process. And then maybe one of these students had sold the jewelry to this sophomore girl, which would explain why she wouldn't want to admit to being in possession of stolen goods that she had purchased. Or maybe she didn't even purchase them at all, and a male student had given them to her as a way to impress her. And maybe she didn't say anything to protect him. This is, of course, all speculation on my part, but it kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? One thing that I think gives some credence to the theory about one of the fellow students being involved 
is when the FBI had interviewed the students that were on the field trip, they all had the same thing to say about what they think happened to Trini. They had all said that they believe Trini had planned to meet someone at the park and ran off with them. Which is definitely a theory, and I will get into that here in a second. But I think it's really weird that they reportedly all said that. Almost as if they had agreed to say this in some kind of possible cover-up. Now, you guys can take this with how much ever salt you want, because it is just my stupid little opinion, and obviously that does not hold much water. Now, circling back to everyone saying that Trini ran away with someone, this is actually a really popular theory. And everyone saying this may not have been some sinister plot like my stupid brain had told me. It might be something much more innocent, like what if Trini told people that she was planning to do this? But the real question is, how could Trini have possibly planned this? If you remember, the students didn't even know they were going to the Great Smoky Mountains that day. So how could Trini have carefully planned for someone to have picked her up? It was 1976, so it's not as if they had cell phones. And I'm not exactly sure, but I don't think the National Park would have had very many, if any, pay phones. And even if they did, I'm sure someone would have reported seeing Trini make a phone call. Also, everyone said that Trini ran away with someone, but it's not clear as to who. As far as I know, Trini did not have a boyfriend or anything, so who she could have possibly ran away with is a mystery. And I definitely don't think it was a horny hitchhiker. There also doesn't seem to be much of a reason for Trini to have run away. She was an excellent student who was well on her way to a successful life. She had even been saving all of her money from her job at the mall to buy a car and for college. In fact, Trini had over $8,000 in her bank account at the time of her disappearance, which is a lot for a teenager. I mean, I think I blew my entire paycheck on just dumb teenager stuff when I was that age. This money was also never withdrawn, and you would think that if Trini had run away, she would have needed this money. Which brings me to my next point. She also had nothing with her. Like I mentioned, she had left her purse in her mom's car, which I'm assuming would have had her identification inside. Also, if she wanted to run away, she really could have done it whenever. So at the end of the day, she had no clothes, no money, and no prior knowledge of where she was going to be that day. Therefore, I really don't think the evidence points to Trini running away either on her own or with somebody. Another popular theory is that the mountains took Trini Gibson, which does hold more water. So many people go missing in national parks every year and unfortunately, oftentimes succumb to the elements. Maybe Trini did veer off the trail at that place that she was last seen and became hopelessly lost. It was October, so I would have to think that the temperatures would have gotten pretty cold in the mountains at night. It is very possible that Trini could have suffered from hypothermia and unfortunately passed away. She also may not have even wandered off. On Trini's page for the Charlie Project, it mentions that the Forney Creek Trail has very steep drop-offs. So maybe Trini could have fallen down an embankment or something and became seriously injured. Although, with both of these theories, I find it unlikely that Trini's remains would not have been found. But then again, the Smokies are very vast, and who knows how far Trini could have ended up. Some have speculated that Trini may have fallen victim to the mountain's wildlife, such as a black bear. However, according to a quick Google search, 
Black bears kill less than one person per year, according to the North American Black Bear Center. And this next part actually made me chuckle a little bit. They wrote that men ages 18 to 24 are 167 times more likely to kill someone than a black bear. So personally, I find this theory to be less than likely. During my research, I surprisingly did not see the possibility of suicide mentioned. With most missing persons cases, this is at least somewhat of a theory. So I was surprised to not see it mentioned. Although, just like with running away, there wasn't any real sign that Trini would have wanted to end her life. Also, with most suicides, people almost always leave a note, which was not the case here. I also find it unlikely that Trini would have committed suicide on a field trip, one that she was very much looking forward to going on. By all accounts, she was in very good spirits that day, so something would have had to have changed her mood so abruptly had she committed suicide. One thing that did come to my mind, based on where Trini's scent was tracked to the road, was the possibility of Trini being struck by a vehicle. And perhaps the driver of this vehicle didn't want to get in trouble and concealed Trini's body somewhere. But just like with the other possibilities, it is just another theory in an already extremely bizarre case. 16-year-old Trini Lynn Gibson disappeared in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park nearly 50 years ago now. And those five decades have only uncovered more questions than answers. I find it unlikely that Trini ran away, but former students still say in interviews to this day that they think she did. You guys might have guessed, but I definitely believe that the fellow students on the field trip should have been looked at a little more closely. However, a couple did once come forward saying that they noticed a young girl emerging from a car full of young men. And this girl had came up to their door and asked for money and to use their phone. When they declined to help her, they say the girl just angrily walked back to the car. This couple swears that this girl was Trini Gibson, but law enforcement has their doubts. Other than this, there doesn't seem to have been any other potential sightings of Trini Gibson and no new viable information that could lead to her whereabouts. Unfortunately, most of Trini's immediate family has since passed away. Trini's older brother, Bob, passed away in 2000, followed by the passing of her father in 2004. Trini's younger sister, Tina, also passed away in 2016. But as far as I can tell, Trini's mother, Hope Gibson, is still alive and staying true to her name hoping that she will get answers about what happened to her teenage daughter in the Great Smoky Mountains all those years ago. At the time of her disappearance, Trini Lynn Gibson was 16 years old and would today in March of 2024 be 63. Trini had long brown hair and green eyes. She stood at five feet, three inches tall and weighed about 115 pounds. She was last seen wearing a blue blouse, a pastel blue striped sweater, blue jeans, and blue Adidas shoes. She was also still wearing Robert Simpson's brown and orange plaid wool jacket. If you have any information about the disappearance of Trini Gibson on October 8th, 1976, please contact the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation at 615 744-4000. You can also contact the National Park Service at 888-653-0009. Thank you everyone for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. I will be back next week with a brand new video and case. To be sure that you do not miss out, go ahead and subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to let me know your thoughts on this case, please utilize the comments or at me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. 
If you have any case suggestions, please email your suggestion to truecrimegurruchannel at gmail.com or you can hit me up on social media. Thank you everyone and please stay safe.